want to tell you a little bit about uh, a development that took my, me by surprise uh, last year. Uh, and that is this uh, connection between work, well, there's time frequency localization, which we have been talking about, uh, then Wilson basis, which I mentioned uh, a little bit about and which we'll discuss in, in, in greater detail today, and uh, gravitational waves. So, um, <laughs> well, there is, uh, there was this, this uh, paper on our archive, this version, uh, a later version, the final version was, was somewhere in, in April, I believe, on, on archive. Uh, it, it actually, this is only a list of, of partial list of the authors. Um, this <coughs> is the paper as it appeared in Physical Review Letters. And if you uh, uh, look into the uh, into the paper, then at some point, well, I mean, let's first see a few of the. I mean, so this this was uh, to remind you, if if you need to remind it, uh, the experiment that uh, with with uh, by correlating uh, detectors over a, a, a large distance looked at uh, the event of uh, uh, merging of, of of two enormous masses. In and and uh, from there, and this is a picture that we've all seen uh, uh, zillions of times, detected uh, this this by now famous profile uh, of of uh, 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 and and confirmed by the two observations of uh, a chirping uh, waveform that you see here, and uh, that is uh, the, the the signature of the gravitational wave. So if you look in that text, then you find somewhere that uh, frame frequency domain using the wilson dope she meyer wavelet transform. Now, they're not wavelets at all, I mean, to begin with. Uh, and and uh, I was conf uh, surprised by this, this juxtaposition of names. But I mean, it, it, it's well, it's explained by the fact, so this reference 34 that's given here is this paper. And they uh, talk about, uh, they give a special uh, a time frequency transform uh, and they say, share some properties with the Gabor frames. It circumvents the balian low theorem, which we saw last time. And it also shares a similarity to Meyer wavelet. And so that's why they called it, uh, uh, the, the, the Meyer got attached to it. And uh, so, um, so that's the connection with gravitational waves. I mean, the surprising thing to me, and so we can cut here for the moment uh, for with the projection. The rest for the moment will be on on the uh, on 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 on, on the, the, the blackboard, and we'll come back to the screen at the very end. So the surprising uh, thing, and I probably need to put lights. Um, Éclairage tableau. Yes, magic. So the surprising thing was that uh, these Wilson bases which in a paper with Stéphane Jaffard and Jean-Lin Journet and myself uh, we <coughs> had uh, formulated uh, to circumvent the Balian Low theorem, and which we'd advertised to physicists, I mean, which you hoped physicists would pick up for atomic and molecular computations. Uh, they actually, and I'll come back to that, had as a, a result of our construction other constructions took place, which were uh, uh, so these led to localized. Uh, uh, cosine trigonometric bases <coughs> by uh, Rafi Koifman and Yves Meyer. And after their construction, I expected that uh, the original construction would actually not be as, as, as used to it anymore, and that's indeed the case for many numerical purposes. But <coughs> then with the gravitational wave thing, the fact that these had such simple expressions in terms of Gaussians became relevant again. 
and that's how they were used. So I'll, I'll, I, I want to tell you not only the construction and how it works and why it was such a, 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 a fun surprise, but then also all these other developments that came from it and how it situates in this bigger space of time frequency bases, which is not in the paper. But Okay, so as we saw last uh, uh, two weeks ago, um, it is impossible, so there exists no possible function h that has a uh, good decay in uh, space and good decay in frequency and such that for some choice of tau and omega, the family H, M, and X well, let's put the I, M, omega constitutes an orthonormal basis. <laughs> and that's the Balian's row theorem, and we proved that. Uh, uh, so proof, we did that in two stages. We first did a proof, well, you need two stages, but I did the second stage uh, uh, later, the first stage later. First, uh, what you really need to prove is that an orthonormal basis requires that the product of tau and omega equals to pi. We saw that by looking at time frequency localization operators on a big region in time frequency space and showing that the trace of such an operator was proportional to the area divided by 2 pi. And then uh, uh, for tau omega equals to 2 pi, it turns out that the Zach transform is a, an excellent tool to analyze this. And the Zach transform uh, uh, showed that having an orthonormal basis was equivalent to asking that the Zach transform of H which is a function of two variables, have magnitude 1. And that was incompatible with that, because functions that satisfy this have to have a zero in their Zach transform. OK, so that's what we did. And that's how we showed that there was no such orthonormal basis. So that's Balian. <laughs> then. Um, orthonormal wavelets came along in the 80s, orthonormal basis of wavelets, and they were really surprising because there, instead of translating and dilating, what one did was, when starting from one function, you, uh, in order to get, you took a function that had some oscillations, so in Fourier, you thought of it as something that had a zero here at xi equals zero. So this is psi hat of xi. If you took your psi to be symmetric, then uh, 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 to be a real function, then its absolute value was symmetric in Fourier. So this was psi hat xi. Um, and so if you, in order to reach different frequency ranges in wavelets, what you do is you scale. So morally you're living here and you scale to larger and to smaller frequencies. So you uh, typically do it by a factor 2, 2 to the j x. And then, well, each psi itself in, in x space is typically well localized, something like this. And so it only covers a certain region in X. And then to 
cover in this frequency range, so with this scaling, different places in X, you have to translate it. If you make this function, if you expand it to higher frequencies, so you make it much more narrow in X space, uh, you have to translate it by small steps. If you make it very wide, you translate by big steps. So you do here a translating. And so this gives you uh, psi 2 to the jx minus k. You normalize in L2. So you look at these families of functions. And as Yves Meyer showed for the first time, but it turned out it was already uh, in an earlier construction, it was already implicit in an earlier construction of Jan Olof Stromberg. It is possible to find functions psi that are beautifully localized in time and in frequency that give you orthonormal basis. So how, I mean, first of all, you generate things in a completely different way and dilations do something completely different to you. I hope to come back to that because there's still some puzzles that I don't understand there. But uh, uh, so you weren't really having a nice lattice. If you think of this as a, uh, sitting in time frequency space and having a function that's well localized around time zero and, 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 and frequency zero when m and n are equal to zero, different values of n will move you around in time. Different values of m will move you to different locations in frequency. And if you do both of them, then you kind of cover the plane with a lattice. And the condition tau omega to pi is a, a condition on the area of that lattice cell. If you do a similar, if you think of the wavelet construction, the wavelet construction is one in which you, you sit, let's look at positive frequency or only, you sit at a positive frequency because you're zero at zero frequency if you look only at this side and you translate in time by certain amounts. If you go to the half the frequency, you translate by twice as much. If you go to double the frequency, you translate by half the amount. So you have again a kind of tiling if, if, if um, it's, it's kind of harder to, to link things, but if for each of these, these points you you draw the, the, the rectangle that corresponds to it best, like here and, and, and here. <coughs> and then here I have one that's... Then you see again that they have constant area. And uh, so you have again a covering, but in a different way than with the old lattice. But the difference is, I very carefully drew only positive frequencies here, that I have these two bumps. So definitely, if I like to think of localization in frequency space, then in fact they're all localized here, because they have stuff on the negative and the positive axis. So it's not a carrying away. So it's true that if you look at the quantity xi squared, which is of interest, then you're moving things to higher and higher things. But, uh, uh, but you can't also say that you have stuff at xi equals zero because the thing is really zero there. So it's a different localization. Now you could say, well, since I am covering the whole frequency plane with uh, uh, dilation, that I mean, the, here I was reaching different frequencies by moving stuff. So I can move from positive to negative frequencies. That's not the case here. What lives at positive frequencies remains there. What lives at half negative frequencies remains there. So you could imagine trying to see whether you could do something on just L2 of R plus uh, the Fourier transform of that. Uh, well, the inverse Fourier transform of that, which is a, a Hardy space. And you could say, can I do orthonormal bases there? And it turns out you can't. You have a similar obstruction. It's not the same proof, but Pascal Auchet proved that, that you can't do that. So uh, it seems that the, the two bump situation in the wavelet, orthonormal wavelet base case is essential. Now, it, it's essential, but it doesn't have to be nicely symmetric. In fact, you can make constructions in which you have 
a thin link in here and I mean you can make and these of course are complex wavelets uh, in which the magnitude of the wavelet looks like this and uh, what happens is that the integral of 1 over xi psi hat xi squared between on the negative axis has to be equal to the integral of 1 over xi of psi hat squared on the positive axis. So you have it on r plus and r minus. These have to be equal. But you can still do that by putting this thing very, very close to the zero with very little L2 weight here. So you can make orthonormal basis for L2 of r that do this. But they're not really very useful uh, because you've, you've kind of cheated. You have looked at, at much tinier frequencies at negative frequencies than at positive frequencies. You're coupling things in a weird way. Heaven knows, this might at some point have some, some, uh, 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 some, some uh, applications. I have never seen any, but you can construct these. But as soon as you don't want anything there, you have this no-go theorem. So that as a little side remark. And, um, oh no, maybe it's here. Okay, so that's a side remark to which I will come back. In the late, in the <coughs> mid to late 80s, Ken Wilson uh, produced uh, 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 several preprints. As far as I know, none of them have actually been published. I found, I got a preprint uh, uh, when I was uh, visiting Guy Battle in, in Montreal. She says, look, this is a very interesting paper. And I got really intrigued by it. And, uh, and so that's the paper from which we then did our work. It's only much later that I realized they had never been published. I then, if you look in the, uh, uh, the, the Cornell arch ar uh, archives of the Ken Wilson papers, you can find a different preprint there in which he, uh, uh, which is co-authored with several other people, in which he's using a similar construction with some applications, but again, that was never published. I don't know whether these were submitted. They weren't very well written. So it may well be that they were submitted and the reviewer said, this has to be rewritten and it wasn't done. I mean, and that might be the reason. But, but so uh, I, I'm trying to uh, get permission to post the original paper uh, from which I worked on, 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 on Archive because, well, now it has some historical relevance. But so what Ken Wilson proposed was to say, uh, I don't know whether he was aware of, of, of the wavelet work, but he, he, based on the fact that xi squared is really the quantity you're interested in, he said, why don't we think of functions, so instead of trying to build bases <coughs> of the form HMN like we do, let's think of, I mean my notation, not his, let's think of a function Fm that uh, in, in lives in frequency, uh, so let's uh, think of a function that has a bump around m and around negative m and is nicely localized between these two. And then let's uh, look at the inverse Fourier transform of this and translate those around. So in a sense, you are, as was uh, said in the abstract of the article of uh, Nerula, uh, Nicola, uh, Klimenko and uh, Mitzelmacher, Macher, that uh, uh, you, you're putting a little bit wavelet-like, Meyer-like in your time frequency construction. You're coupling negative and positive frequencies together. And that, of course, will enable you to build a function so that uh, uh, this thing is, is, uh, is, is, is real, if you wish. Um, 
and uh, then uh, can we make an orthonormal basis? And so uh, Wilson didn't provide an explicit construction, but gave convincing numerical evidence that this might be possible. So you want these to be an orthonormal basis. And in fact, the formula that he was proposing, as he was proposing it, well, we, 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 we didn't manage to make work, uh, Stéphane Jaffard and, and, and Jeanlin and, and, and I. But what we found was a, uh, a construction, uh, well, Stéphane Jaffard came up with that, that, that formula was really intriguing. So um, what, uh, it was a combination of cosines and sines. And so let me take the original one that he proposed. So he said, let's build one function phi. Uh, I mean, and so that's what we're going to see, that it's possible to do this. And we are going to call f1 hat. So actually, I'm, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to do it this way. f1 hat is going to be this function phi. So that's a bump function in Fourier space. And then we are going to move this bump to positive and negative uh, axis. So we're going to take uh, phi in <coughs> xi minus L and xi plus L. And uh, we, this thing will be normalized because we want that to be normalized. So these things, since they will be far apart, we have to normalize their linear combination. So we'll call that f hat l xi. Actually, except I will make my index for, I will have a, I will call this 2l plus kappa. So l here is going to be in the uh, in in the natural numbers. My, my natural numbers do not include zero. If your natural numbers don't include zero, then this is superfluous. If they do, then uh, you have to remove it. And kappa will be zero or one. And then there will be a phase factor. Um, So I have here, and then I put here an i pi i kappa xi. So what's <laughs> so this seems complicated, but in fact what's happening is that depending on the parity of L and kappa, I either take a positive or a negative combination here, which really means that I'm looking at either when I Fourier transform back to a cosine or a sine. So I'm going to mix cosines and sines. This phase factor uh, means that I am going to, so my Fourier transform is uh, not normalized the way I had done it before. Uh, I had to give in to working with uh, uh, Yes, so my Fourier transform now, so it's not the normalization I've used before, my Fourier transform now is given as e to the 2 pi i x xi uh, g of x dx, with maybe a plus or a minus sign, I forget. Uh, no, there's <coughs> whatever. There seems to be a plus sign there. So I put my 2 pi here, and what that means is that this if kappa is zero, it doesn't matter, but if kappa is one, it means that I'm translating by a half. So the result is that if I look now at, so I have defined here f hat m's for m in n minus zero. I start from one and then I have two, three, four, five, and so on all here. 
I, if I then take those functions and I move them by integers, I now have a kind of hybrid family in which I'm mixing uh, cosines and sines with the m's, depending on whether m is even or odd, and kappa is even or odd. And I'm also translating not just by integers, but also if the kappa is not zero by a half integer. So I have a complicated, well, complicated. I have a, 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 a something that's a little bit more complicated than that lattice. And the idea is, uh, it turns out that if you define that family, so defining cosines and sines, and looking at integer and half integer translates, that you um, then uh, there are then one can construct phi such that uh, the f uh, m n constitute an orthonormal basis for L2 of R. Um, so that was the point of the Wilson basis. But the surprising thing is that you can relate that orthonormal basis. So it's not just a question of a trick of combining positive and negative frequencies. You can relate it to taking a lattice in the original sense that is too dense and weeding things out in a good way. So we're back to time frequency and recombining things appropriately. It's very well possible that there are yet other ways of weeding out frames, which I will call frames and we'll see that in a sec, in, in time frequency space and making them. So let's leave this for a moment and go to frames. So, parentheses. Time frequency frames. So, <coughs> the time frequency frames started really as a result of the Balion Low theorem. We wanted to localize nicely. We wanted to, uh, to have good time frequency localization. You couldn't do it with orthonormal basis, so let's make redundant. And, one, and, and uh, uh, on the other hand, we also knew, we had known for a long time, that you had this nice continuous transform, which I also introduced to you. I mean, if I defined uh, uh, the transform for a function uh, in, in uh, t and nu as the integral over r, of f of s e to the minus i uh, nu s, uh, and then some window function s minus t. Then we had seen that you could very nicely uh, uh, reconstruct f uh, from taking that windowed Fourier transform and uh, right, uh, yeah, so right, the windowed here moved to t and nu, uh, dt, d nu. Uh, so there was a reconstruction of the identity for a, a decomposition. So uh, it, it seemed natural to uh, look at the situation where you would take a window function and you would, instead of taking labels that would be continuous, let me put these in, in square brackets here to distinguish them from what I'm going to do now. So mn of s would be just a window moved by a multiple of, of t and uh, e to the minus e to the i nu uh, s uh, with a phase factor, uh, 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 n omega s, sorry, with a f uh, uh, m, I'm going to get there. Uh, so make this family of functions and see whether you could, uh, uh, what you could say about. So uh, can one characterize 
f by the sequence f w m n and uh, well the question is not just characterize f but uh, properties of f by properties of the sequence and the answer is yes you can do that very beautifully uh, um, and in fact, what if your window is nicely concentrated in time and frequency, then every FWM it's like it's like a little crumb, a little nugget of information around that time and frequency location, and you can look at where things live in time frequency. And that's how you build those spectrograms that I showed you at the very first, I mean on at the very first lecture, with these 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 color schemes over time frequency plane to give you localization in time frequency. Okay. Um, now, mathematically, what are you doing? You're mapping L2 of R to, it turns out, L2 of Z2. So you make a, uh, a square uh, 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 sequence, a square summable sequence over its two labels. And what you find is that uh, TF squared, which is just the sum over m and n of these inner products, uh, typically satisfies the property, I mean that it's, I mean if you have a good frame then you satisfy that you sandwich your original norm both above and below and whenever we have something like that we say that the family of functions in this case we have it labeled by z2 but it doesn't have to be uh, in z2 any any family of functions that satisfies this condition that when you take inner products with them, they give you this kind of, of sandwiching of the original norm, is form constitute a frame. In the case that we are considering, where we build our frame by time frequency translations, that's only possible. if nu times t is less than or equal to 2 pi. When, when, when the, the mesh of your lattice is too big, you just don't have enough... <laughs> you don't have enough vectors to cover the, the full range. Uh, so that's the, the argument that we used you know, to show that you need at least... Uh, that tau omega can be at most 2 pi, so you need at least that many. Okay, so um, you, uh, how do you build a frame? Well, a very simple way, a simple way, I mean there are many ways to build uh, is be twice as redundant as needed for an orthonormal basis. Incidentally, uh, most frames have redundancy, and uh, I mean this 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 looks very similar to the kind of thing you would write for an orthonormal basis, and uh, uh, but. In general, you have redundancy, and a very the, 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 the easiest example to convince yourself of what's going on, of, of what may be going on, is uh, what 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 uh, some people call the Mercedes frame, uh, which is a frame where you work in two dimensions and you consider three vectors that have equal length and that make angles of 120 degrees with each other. 
I mean, and so you see, uh, it starts looking like Mercedes. Um, so uh, uh, the what happens if you take these three vectors is that if you take if you take them of length one, and you uh, take your vectors <laughs> uj squared, and you take the sum for one to three, then you find that you get exactly three halves v squared. You see, you get uh, uh, the 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 these two contribute uh, 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 three quarters, another three quarters of the x component, and this contributes the whole y component, and these contribute uh, twice <coughs> a quarter of the x component squared, and so it adds up nicely to that. So that's a very easy frame. It's a frame where you have equality all through, and that's the simplest example of what's called a tight frame. A tight frame is a frame where a and b are equal to one. OK, so um, let's do, we need redundancy. Well, let's take a frame that's twice as redundant. So what we, should, what we can do is we can take a frame, uh, we can take a frame that is uh, well, how do we make it, make it twice as redundant? We can look at e to the 2 pi i and uh, s, and then we can look at s minus m over 2. I mean, so that corresponds to uh, 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 an omega of 2 pi uh, to, to a, uh, a t of a half. The product is pi. So we expect a redundancy of two. I mean, the mesh is half the size. And if you now look at the Zach transform of these, so the Zach transform of the W, M, N. Well, if I make M even, then we've done that already. We did that last time. I mean, that's just integer translates and uh, mod modulations, we know, if we look at that, that we get uh, uh, the Zach transform of W. And uh, we multiply it with uh, e to the 2 pi i m uh, s and uh, e to the 2 pi i and t. If I'm not mistaken, well, let's compute it quickly. Uh, k, sorry. Yeah, there's a k somewhere here. So, well, let me, uh, we get the sum over L of e to the 2 pi i n s minus L w s minus k minus l and uh no uh yes that's the whole thing s minus l and then i have to also write a t to the 2 pi i l t and um so what was I doing here? I was going to change uh, yes, I'm going to change my variable in s minus l. So I have to uh, write here a minus k and a plus k. So that the summation variable becomes l plus k. And so then I write here plus k minus k. And so I have, and it's actually the difference from what I wrote here, it's an e to the pi i n s, and I get a k here. Okay, but so now we see also what we should do for the odd ones. Let's write that out.
uz w 2k plus 1 n s t. So I have to take the function in s minus l, so e to the 2 pi i n s minus l. and w s minus l minus 2k plus 1, so I get minus a half minus k. And that's the function in s minus l. And now I have to multiply by e to the minus 2 pi i l t. Okay, same trick, minus k plus k plus k minus k. And we get e to the 2 pi, we change summation variable, okay. We get e to the 2 pi i uh, n s we get e to the 2 pi i and it probably should have been a plus here since I'm getting a plus out here as well, so 2 pi l, 2 pi kt. And then I have exactly the experience, so I get the sum here now over l prime of e to the 2 pi i uh, uh, what do I get? This is uh, L minus, uh, and S is gone. Uh, I don't know why did this didn't matter at all. Yeah, there's nothing left, so I shouldn't have done that in the first place. Uh, but I get here e to the two pi minus two pi i L prime uh, t, and then here W S minus a half minus L prime. And so that gives me the Zach transform of W in S minus a half and T. And so just like before, so what I now have is I'm if I'm going to look at these inner products, Mn squared, Mn, because the Zach transform is unitary, it's giving me the sum over mn, and I get the inner products of uzf with the uz of all these. Let me write those immediately as an integral over the square, and I get uzf st, and then I have uz. Okay, I'm going to split my sum in m and n in a sum over even and odd. So I'll split the sum over k, and the k's will even have the either ones, or give me the odd ones. So let's first look at the m to k. So then I get here u z w s t, and I have these phase factors e to the uh, minus two pi i n s, e to the minus two pi i k t. Conjugate here. And that's what I get for all these. And I'm going to have to take the sum squared of these things, the SDT. And then I get, yeah, well, no need to leave me room here because I can't use it. Uh, sorry, the SDT sum squared. And then I have that to care of the sum for the even ones. I still also have the integral over that of uz fst. And then I have uz w s minus a half t conjugate, same factors, the SDT squared. Now, in both cases, Mm -hmm. 
I am looking at uh, the old Fourier coefficients of the function on the unit square. So the sum squared of those are just giving me the L2 norm of that function. So in the first case, I get the integral of uz f s t squared and uz w s t squared. In the second case, I have the same first factor, but I, oh, I have this the SDT. And so now it's, it's what I want, I would like this to be. I would like these inequalities. So, but let's go. You can be hung for a sheep as well as for a mutton, uh, as for a lamb. So, uh, you you let's try to aim straight away as for 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 a equals b. I mean for tight frame. So I would like this to be. Let me say I want this to be f squared. If I do that, then uh, what I need. Since this is equal, since I had a unitary operator, to uz f of s t squared, what I really need is that this quantity should be equal to 1. Can I do that? Well, remember, what do, what do, the, what do we have for this window? <coughs> well, this window is the, the Zach transform of, uh, of, 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 of uh, so uz w of st. It was because of its construction, remember, I'll write it again, sum l in z of w s minus l e to the 2 pi i l t. Uh, or with a minus sign, doesn't matter much. Uh, I know that uh, uh, this, let, yeah, u z w s t plus one is equal to u z w of s t, and u z w of s plus one. So you have a funny kind of, of, of uh, semi periodicity If I put here an s plus 1, then I can move that out, and I find that I get 2 pi i t u z w s t, give or take a, a plus or minus 1 there. So these are the conditions I know that this function has to satisfy. And I know that trying to get its absolute value equal to 1, given those conditions, is impossible. But that's not what I'm trying. I'm trying for this sum to be 1. And that's very easy. And in fact, uh, if you work it out, then um, what you can do What you can do is uh, uh, you can just look at a Gaussian. In, uh, well, the, f the first thing to do is, well, okay. Uh, one example is to take for the window uh, of uh, window of x just a Gaussian. If you compute the uh, Zach transform of the Gaussian on the square 0, 1, then you find that it has a 0 in the middle. It has a single 0. Uh, it's, uh, you get a, a, a type of, of uh, a theta function 
uh, Jacobi theta function and well you can look all of it up and so on it has that single zero um, and uh, if you then look at that function and look at its translate by a half then you have that the sum squares of these has no zero anymore so you have that so let's take a look at this then you have that u z g of s t squared plus u z of g s minus or plus a half squared i mean it's the same thing because of the semi realicity um, uh, is bounded below by a constant and it's bounded above by another constant what that already means and exactly with those constants is that if you use the g uh, uh, x minus um, yeah m over 2 e to the 2 pi i and x so this family so actually with this as the variable constitute a frame with frame constants exactly a and b because well that's exactly what you get but you can now do more what you can do is you can and you can view that it's a construction that you can either view at the level of the frame or you can uh, look at it at the level of the Zach transform so uh, let me uh, get boards down You see what you <coughs> let's do it at the level of, of, the, of the operators. So I have T star so I have T F squared. It's bounded below by A F squared and bound above by B F squared. <coughs> so that is saying that t star t f f is bounded below and above so t star t is a, an operator between sandwich between a the identity and b the identity in the sum in the, the sense of uh, uh, equalities between operators de being defined by when, when an opera upon operator is positive by taking so an operator s is positive if and only if s f f is positive for all f so that defines inequalities between operators and I can then if I look at t star t minus half this multiple of the identity that have this average uh, uh, then I get here that it's bounded between b minus a over 2 and bounded below by negative that number which means that t star t minus a plus b over 2 times the identity is bounded by b minus a over 2 and well I can go on here uh, 
which means that in a certain sense this multiple of t star t is close to the identity meaning that it's smaller than b minus a over b plus a which is a number strictly less than one and that means that we can write this as the identity minus Flemish, we would say that's the truth as big as a cow. And uh, so that means that I can try to invert this operator. By using the standard formula for things that are close to the identity operator. This is small. So identity minus it is just. And so that gives us that t star t is a nice invertible operator, as we could have expected. And uh, we get that it's 2 over a plus b times this. which gives us actually a very, very fast algorithm to, because you can rewrite this as a sum of uh, dyadic powers. So the identity plus then a sum over L of identity minus 2 over a plus b d star t to the power 2 to the l times some partial sum sl which are defined iteratively so How was it again? So SL is really the sum of K0 to 2 to the L minus 1 of the identity minus 2 over A plus B T star T to the K. But that is the same thing as uh, SL minus 1 multiplied by the identity plus identity minus 2 over a plus b t star t to the power uh, 2 to the l minus 1. Uh, so l minus 1 L minus 1, sorry. So you see, you, you, you build it up in dyadic blocks. You just... Uh, is that correct? What am I doing here? Actually, I probably have I've done a little bit too much summing in all this. I probably should write here. This the limit as L goes to infinity. That is certainly true. 
And so what, what happens is that you just build uh, one, one plus the operator, and then you multiply that by the thing squared, and one plus it. And that gives you one plus the operator, plus the operator squared, plus the operator cubed and so on, and by multiplying you get bigger and bigger. So it's, it's very easy to build a very nice uh, iterative thing that converges very fast. And because you have here, because you're really summing this thing and this in norm is less than b minus a over b plus a, which is less than one, you have exponential convergence. You have a geometric on series, and so you have exponential convergence. Mm. So you can also... Now, if you think of what you're doing in terms of the Zach transform, what you're really doing is you're defining a function g twiddle by saying that it's Zach transform. I mean, you're inverting this operator t star t, which corresponds to that multiplication, which means that you are dividing this by this thing squared. Well, no, that's not what I was saying. Wha what I wanted to say is t star t minus 1 of a function and the Zach transform of that in st is the Zach transform of that divided by this. Which is fine because this needs these funny periodicity conditions. The funny periodicity conditions only affect the phase factor. So this thing is periodic. And so this thing will still have the same funny periodicity conditions as before. And so this has the right uh, uh, shape to be in the image of the Zach transform of L2. And so this does define that inverse operator. We have no problem with that. Uh, but why am I working so hard on that inverse operator? Well, now a little bit of abstract nonsense. Um, I, I would like, so I, I have that f, tf is this sequence of f with the wmn's. What is t star t f? Well, t star t f inner product with g is the inner product of t f with t g is in little l2 the inner product of the sequence with these entries with then the inner product of the similar entries with G and complex conjugation, give me this. So I can write F G S T star T F T star T negative 1 g. And if I work all this out, then I get here sum over mn, f w m n, and I will have the inner products of this. Uh, I did a foolish thing. No, I didn't. I can put this higher. Okay.
Okay, so I can rewrite this as the sum over mn of f w m n t star t minus 1 or if I understand it in weak form this gives me a way of recovering f from its windowed Fourier coefficients by using these functions. Now, you can convince yourself that uh, t star t commutes with translating minus uh, t and multiplying by 2 to the b i. Uh, well, I had omega, didn't I? What did I do? <sighs> I've lost it. Uh, 2 pi. Yeah. 2 pi i dot t. Um, but, so you can work that out, but we can also still see it still from the Zach transform. Remember, in the Zach transform, doing this translation in, 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 in x and modulating was like multiplying with that phase factor, e to 2 pi as it's 1. So uh, t star t, we have seen, is just like multiplying with a nice periodic function. I mean, that's not hurting, multiplying with these phase factors. I mean, since the whole thing is periodic, you can do that before or after, and it doesn't matter. So this is just to, to make a shortcut and not have to, to compute here that this, if I first do the inverse on the window function and then look at it and it's... Uh, I'm, I'm going to look, in my case, at uh, translates and e to the 2 pi i and, and, and s, that this is the same thing as taking the t star t minus 1 of these functions, w, m, n, uh, and that then taken <coughs> in s. So, Say in, 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 other, in other words, applying this inverse operator to each of these translated modulated functions consists in just computing one of them and then translating and modulating it. And so what that means is I just need to here build a W twiddle. Uh, so this is W twiddle mn, which is... Uh, uh, yeah, the translates and modulates of that function. So that's exactly what I was showing you I can do. I can take the inverse. So if, my, if I take a Gaussian to begin with, then I can take my Gaussian, divide it by that sum squared of, of UCG and UGG uh, translated, and I will have the corresponding G twiddle. But I can actually do even a little bit more. I mean, so yes, I know how to invert, but I could have from the very start, I mean, after all, what have I written here? Um, F um, Okay, I've lost the thread of what I was going to say, so let me erase a board while I would find my thread again. Um, So what we have found is um, a tight frame of the form window x minus m over 2 e to the 2 pi i and x 
m n in z is equivalent to asking that its z transform satisfies this. If uh, for general W, uh, we have so not satisfying this condition, but not satisfying this equal to 1, but still a smaller than smaller than b with a positive and b finite. We have that f can be written as the sum over mn of f w mn w twiddle mn where uz of w twiddle is uz of w divided by that expression star. So all that is stuff that we have now established. So that inverse is, is really useful, but I can do, as I said, a little bit more. Suppose I have a W for which that expression star satisfies B and so on. And suppose instead of trying to find this dual function W twiddle that I'm doing here, that I need in order to recover from the image TF, f itself. Suppose I do something that goes halfway. So let's consider the following. Let's consider a w sharp which has the property that its Zach transform is the Zach transform of w divided by the square root of star. I mean that function is perfectly well defined, so I can do that. And this is still going to satisfy these kind of semi-periodic conditions that a Zach transform must satisfy, so I'm doing something fine. What it really corresponds to is that W sharp is just the square root of this inverse operator applied to W. And so for that also, just like I had a fast a converging exponential expansion from the operator t star t. I can have a fast exponential convergence from, from, from this uh, 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 a fast uh, uh, iterative thing if I don't want to go via the Zach transform. Okay, so um, then it's kind of, of uh, uh, if I now look at the uz of w sharp in st squared plus uz of w sharp in s plus a half or s minus a half t squared. It's, I'm going to have that the numerator and the denominator will cancel out and I will find that this is equal to one. So w sharp will uh, generate a tight frame with frame constant 1. So in practice, both ways of looking at all this are useful. 
in some cases you get I mean your windowed Fourier transform. It's given to you by, by a setup and so on, or you have computed it, or you've given it to it by somebody else, and you want to recover f. So then you use the inverse operator. In some cases, and that's the case for the, the, the Wilson-based construction, you actually get to choose your window m. And then it makes sense to start, for instance, with the Gaussian window, for which a and b are fairly close to each other. So this ratio b minus a over a plus b is fairly small. And so you have really fast convergence for your iterative algorithms. And you can build this uh, uh, function. And actually, I, 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 I'm going to give you, uh, so can we switch for a moment back to the screen? Um, so oh, I have to do the lights. Ah, and I have to bring this down. Let me do that first. Oh, well, maybe we don't even have to do the lights because we don't have to. So this is, uh, so this was that paper. So let me minimize that. And let's, where is it? Ah, here, you said. So this is the paper on about which I'm talking. And if we go near the end, Okay, so it's getting very slow. <coughs> Sorry. I have a figure here somewhere. No, it's not here. And uh, so, some of the computations I've done here are in there. Some of them are done differently. Uh, but uh, <coughs> where is the graph? I always believe when you construct functions in showing what they look like. So in fact, um, this particular function, and this is its Fourier transform, uh, uh, do satisfy that uh, they're there. Uh, so you see they're built from Gaussians with a very fast exponential decay. Okay, so let's get back to the board. So why we've now talked about, about these frames, these tight frames, and I've convinced you, I hope, that I can construct them, I can nicely computationally, and they have this fast decay. What do they have to do with this Wilson basis? Well, let's go back to the Wilson basis. And let's try to see what it means to have a Wilson basis. So, what I wanted was, I was telling you, I had special ways of constructing functions fm, which were done by juggling phase factors and sines and cosines. And I wanted to, so I had these functions fm that I was going to construct, and I wanted the fm x minus n to be an orthonormal basis. Let's look at what this means. Well, it certainly means that you want, uh, well, you want the <coughs> sum over m and n of, a of any function, uh, h. Uh, let's call this f m n. And the sum for m was going from 1 to infinity. The sum for n was over all z. You want this to be equal to f squared. 
and this remember I'm now uh, because I want to be consistent with that paper so that I can look up a formula if, if, if I start screwing up um, I'm my four Fourier transform is now exceptionally defined when when we wrote this paper this is actually the last paper in which I still felt like a physicist when I wrote it. It's the very last paper that I wrote in which I have when the inner product in a Hilbert space is linear in the second argument and not in the first argument. But uh, the, the only way I could uh, win that point together with my, my, and later I didn't care anymore, but then I still cared, uh, win that point with my two mathematician co-authors was that I had to take their Fourier transform. So the Fourier transform here is h of x So the 2 pi is there. So um, what that means it's no longer unitary so I have a factor here um, but so I'm going to have well I don't know where it's unitary I'm not used to that one. Uh, And so um, this is the, so I have the sum over m and then the sum over n and z. And here I have h hat xi, f hat m xi conjugate, um, e to the 2 pi i n xi. Okay, and here we do the usual trick. Actually, uh, in the paper it said you do uh, uh, um, the Poisson formula, but whenever you say Poisson formula to a mathematician, they say, oh, you have to verify all kinds of conditions. In fact, if you work with L2, you don't at all. And so that's why I usually do it the way I'm going to explain it now. The first thing I do is I say, well, I have the perfect right to... Um, write this sum as a sum of integrals over pieces integral from l to l plus one and uh, so i had this thing squared okay so i'm writing my integral as a succession of little pieces of integrals you can't stop me from doing that um, then because everything is going to be uh, really, I'm, I'm considering functions f that decay very nicely and so on, so everything converges and so on, I can pull <laughs> that summation in. Uh, yeah, first, I, I, for each of these, I'm going to make a change of summation. I'm going to, inter to, to, to make my variable zeta plus l, and here it's zeta plus l, and zeta plus l, the l I can forget about, it doesn't matter, d zeta. And now my integral is from 0 to 1. Once I have done that, I'm pulling my summation in because everything converges as nicely as you wish. So I take it out here. And I now have a function here <coughs> that is periodic and of which I'm taking all the Fourier coefficients. And that, I know, is going to be equal to the sum, to the, uh, to the, uh, the, the, the integral of, the, uh, of that function <coughs> squared. <coughs> and integral d zeta. And now, <coughs> why do you put the square inside the sum there? Uh, I should have done this. Thank you. <coughs> and uh, and now I can unwrap that sum. So. Let me be careful. <laughs> so 
So sum over m is not concerning me for the moment. <coughs> the sum 0 to 1. And I have here, I'm going to write a sum over L and L prime. And I have H zeta plus L, H hat zeta plus L prime, <coughs> F hat M zeta plus L, F hat M zeta plus L prime, and the whole thing d zeta. And again, everything converges absolutely, so I can do all the changes I want. And uh, I can, I'm going to do a number of things here. I'm going to write this as zeta plus L minus L prime, plus L prime minus L, and here the same thing. Then I'm going to say, well, I can take the sum over L out. Now I can change the integration. Instead of dragging the zeta plus L, I'll call it xi. And I'm integrating from L to L plus 1 in xi. I'm also in the sum over L prime, I'm going to redefine the, the, the summation variable. I'm going to call this a sum of k. Do I have a k for the moment? Not yet. And so this becomes k. And now I see that I have no L dependence in this integral anymore. And so the sum over L of integrals from L to L plus L is just the sum over the all of, is an integral over all of R. And the sum over K I can take out as well. And I get H hat Xi, H hat Xi plus K, <coughs> Fm hat Xi, Fm Xi plus K. And I don't have to verify any of the, uh, nasty conditions for the Poisson summation formula, everything works out. Okay. So, that's that. Now, uh, what did I want to do that? Uh, okay, so, this I want to be, I want that to be, shoot, what did I do here? That should have been h squared. Thank you so much. I want that to be the integral. So let me work towards that. <coughs> uh, the sum m equals, uh, So if k equals 0, then I have the integral r. Is that how I make sure that I don't screw up too much? Okay, so I should have been a little bit more. Well, I can get it from polarization. I mean, I could have done the same thing from the start, but if I had said H, uh, H1, uh, H2 should be equal to sum over Mn of uh, H1 
F M N F M N H two. Then what I would have seen is that this here, if I work it out, is the sum over m and k of the integral h1 hat psi h2 hat psi plus k f m hat <coughs> psi f m psi plus k d psi. Uh, with complex conjugations, okay. And this I can write as the integral of h1 hat psi h2 hat psi times the sum, and m was a sum from 1 to infinity, remember, a long time ago. And then I have a sum over um, so I was for k equals zero. Now I have a sum for k different from zero of the integral h1 hat xi h2 xi plus k. And then I write here the sum m equals 1 to infinity of f m hat xi f hat xi plus k d xi. So, in order for this, so this is what, I mean, this is just stupid, stupid careful computations. And, but I want, I want to set this, this to be a nice basis. <coughs> and, uh, So we see that it's we would like this sum to be one, and we would like this sum to be 0 if k is different from 0. So in fact, what we would like is this to be delta k0. So that's all we need. If we satisfy it, it turns out to be necessary as well, <coughs> but it's certainly sufficient. So uh, great. So we're rid of, of, of at least of one of the variables, of, of the, 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 the things as well. Uh, we, we have still uh, uh, conditions, but we have uh, uh, fewer conditions than before. Now remember what Fm was. Fm hat, so we had f hat 1 psi was going to be the function phi of psi. And then we wanted the other ones we had this very funny condition. This was 1 over <coughs> square root 2. And then we had here phi of xi plus l and phi of minus l and phi xi plus l. And we had a phase factor and e to the pi i kappa. Uh, yeah, that is what I seem to remember. Okay, so what is this? 
Well, let's plug it in. So we have to sum for kappa. So we have, first of all, um, and here L goes from 1 to infinity and kappa is in 0, 1. Uh, not 0, 1, 0, 1. <coughs> so we have here. Um, let's look at the sum when kappa equals 1. So we look at the odd ones here. Then what we get is a half sum for L is 1 to infinity and we get phi xi minus L minus minus 1 to the L phi xi plus L and uh, e to the pi i, and then we have to phi xi minus l plus uh, yeah, and this is for all k in z plus k. And uh, hmm? I think there is a, a conjugate of the first factor. Yes, my phi is going to be real, but I mean I have to write the phase factor as well. So e to the negative pi i xi. And now I write plus uh, no l is still negative minus minus 1 to the L uh, okay so I'm, I'm trying to confuse I'm getting confused I have to take my M equals 2 L plus Kappa and so I have here uh, and, and change C to C plus K so, um, uh, yes, C plus K minus L uh, plus <laughs> Okay, thank you. And then I have an E to the pi I C plus K. Kappa. But Kappa is 1. So I, okay, fine, wonderful. Uh, so what do I have? This falls out and I have a minus 1 to the k from here. <coughs> and okay and so now we are um, we have to regroup terms. Mm. I had hoped this was less messy, but uh, um. Okay, let's do it for, if I write my kappa in here again, then I'm still very general, aren't I? No, then I have to write a plus again, 
and kappa. And then I have here, I had e to the pi i kappa xi, so a kappa k here. Okay. So I have So we were going to regroup terms of in all directions. Um, so I have phi psi minus L phi psi minus L plus K. That's that and that. Then when I add these there, I also, so I'm going from L equals one to infinity. I also have plus phi psi plus L phi psi plus L plus K. And I have this factor, uh, so I have to do the sum over kappa. So you mean that the sum of the kappa will cancel some terms? Yes, there will lots of things that will cancel. And we just have to yeah. figure out which ones and yes, how. Also some complex conjugate. There is complex conjugation, and uh, um, but let me uh, please. I'm going to take phi real, so I'm going to forget the complex conjugation because that will actually come in handy for me. But I mean, phi is real. Um, okay. Let's try it. Well, let's power through. Uh, this phi. Um, so you have to. Th th this term is, is uh, multiplied by 1 plus minus 1 to the kappa k, I think. Times uh, 1. If you sum on. Uh, you take kappa minus 1 to the k, so. Yes. Yeah. 1 plus minus 1 to the k. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And then. I have the other term. Uh, where I have phi of xi plus L, phi xi minus L plus k, plus phi xi minus L, phi xi plus L plus k, and this multiplies 1 plus minus, uh, wait, 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 minus 1 to the k as before. But then I also have a minus 1 to the, no, I have to be more careful on that. If kappa is 0, I don't have this one, and I have a minus 1 to the L. If kappa is not zero, then I have a minus one to the k and a minus one to the l with a negative sign. Are we happy? Okay, so I can take the minus one to the l out. If this comes out, I will be... <laughs> okay, <coughs> it already starts looking. First of all, what do we have here? We are summing over L1 to infinity, and then the same thing, but with L changed sign. So we're summing really over all the integers, except for zero. And I can forget about this term.
and the same thing in the second. I mean, I have exactly the same uh, expression with L changed sign. And so I have here L and Z, L different from zero. And that makes my expression a little bit less complicated again. Okay, wonderful. Now, and we were looking at, okay. If k is even, then this second term drops out and the first term gives us a half sum L in Z, L different from zero. of phi xi minus l, phi xi minus l, let's say plus 2n. And we wanted that whole thing to be delta k0, so this should be equal to delta n0. And the one half is cancelling with the one plus minus one to the k. Exactly. Wonderful. Thank you. Now, if k is odd, let's do a little sideboard for that. If k is odd, then this cancels out, but that gives us a 2, which cancels out with a half. So we get then some L in Z, L different from 0. And we have minus 1 to the L, phi xi plus L, and then phi xi minus L plus 2N plus 1. <coughs> okay. And now I'm going to make a change of variable. I'm going to call K 2n plus 1 minus L, so that L is 2n plus 1 minus k. And that is going to give me phi of xi uh, plus k for the second term, phi of xi plus 2n plus 1 minus k, and I get minus 1 to the power l, and I get a change of sign. And I have a sum over k in z, and yeah, and that is a nuisance, because that's not what I expected. Um, so we see that a lot of terms cancel out already. Um, so why did I... not zero. So this means that you can compute the sum up to two terms. Yes, exactly. 
but I, I hadn't remembered those two terms, so I hope. Uh, okay, so, uh, so this is that. So this is uh, negative the sum L in Z. Uh, L different from 2n plus 1 of this whole expression. So Case. Yes, they're going to cancel. That's I. <laughs> okay, so um, yes, so I'm going to get. Uh, I think a, a good way would be to, to write the second sum uh -huh. as the same sum for k different from zero, and so you you. You write it exactly as the first sum, but with a change of sign, and then you add the, the two terms, and you see what they, uh -huh. they do. There is okay. a term corresponding to k equals yeah. zero that you withdraw. So I get this minus the term for l equals zero, which is phi psi times phi psi plus 2n plus 1. And then I don't have this, and I don't have that. Uh, I had still minus phi psi phi psi plus 2n plus 1. And, uh, and now I add in L different from, wait, I have that, OK. And so I write that that is minus that sum over k for k different, no, okay, I have that. So I had that and I had that. I think, I think uh, the, the last sign, uh, what, what was it? Uh, yes, it did. So that is that. That is that. Okay, and that is um, so. What I that, that's correct. What I had here was that this is minus that sum uh, for L and so on. And so what you get is that the sum over L in Z for minus one to the L phi xi plus L phi xi minus l plus 2n plus 1, so they don't cancel, equals 2 minus a half of this thing. So if I compute that. But, but the second sum is the exactly minus the other one, so yes. So you get 0, it seems that you get 0 for this sum. Uh, Let's be careful. OK. I want to compute the sum for L in Z and L not 0. The sum for L in Z of the full expression is equal to negative itself. So that's 0. Yes, I, I think it's minus, and then you made a shift. To rewrite the, the same sum, to changing L minus L and making a shift. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Deci cu bine jos. That's why we're being careful. I think the best way is, is really to, to start from the sum you wrote, to sum for L in Z, L different from zero, and to write everything in terms of this. So the, the left hand side is already this one. So what about the right hand side? The right hand side can be written, you can write this one, or minus this one, in fact, plus two other terms, and I, I, I bet that these two terms okay. cancel. Okay, so minus one L. Phi xi plus L on the so that we computed that was k in Z and k different from two n plus one of minus 1 to the k plus 1 phi of xi minus k plus 2n plus 1 phi xi plus k. And note that I have done a slate of hand. I mean, if I had conjugation, then the conjugations would be in the wrong places now. So it was important for me that phi was real. I mean, to get back to, to your concern earlier. OK, so that's true. Um, So, so you can write it down as minus the... And then k is different from that again. Well, and now I can make it L again. And that is minus the original thing, as you were saying. Plus, well, I've subtracted this, so I have to add the term that I took out for L equals 0, which is phi xi, phi xi plus 2n plus 1. And uh, here I had, I didn't have the term that, so in order to bring it down, I have to introduce that term. So, uh, wait, that's minus that. So this I can write as this minus the contribution I would have gotten. So L would have to be different from 2n plus 1. If L was 2n plus 1, then I would have So are we correct that by moving that, I had to add that term? And so I get this, and then minus minus, and another minus, and the 2n gives me uh, a negative phi. Oh, immense relief. Even being careful, it still works out. And so this cancels that. And so this contribution is zero. Wonderful. So we have reduced ourselves to the uh, to this, uh, so let me put that on this board. So we have reduced ourselves to for our original function L without the, all these kappas and, and so on. We want to prove that xi minus L phi xi minus L plus 2n, this should be delta n0. Uh, 
uh, and what if uh, L is zero? Did we have another condition there somewhere? Um, why did I still have the L? I had a, a, another sum, didn't I? Yes, uh, I think you, you, you forgot the sum for corresponding to, to F1. Yes, to F1. And that would have been, uh, in I would not have had the a half, but I only had one term. Yeah. And that one term would have gotten me uh, the, exactly the term that's missing here. For uh, Okay, so let's we take this out and we get that. Okay. <coughs> okay. And now we are I mean, so now it's easy to see that you can construct very easily phi that will satisfy this because uh, you can, and that was the first construction uh, uh, that, that we, 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 we thought of. Uh, so you want a function that uh, you can even make phi nicely compactly supported because what you have is that if you have something that arises like uh, 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 a trigonometric function here, so rises like a, a sine squared, and then descends like a cosine squared, uh, and you 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 translate, and so on. You see that you only at on every interval have to be concerned if the function is supported here from zero to two, with with what happens here. Because as soon as you translate by more than, than, than two, you have no overlap. And here you have a sine squared and a cosine squared, and a sine squared and a cosine squared, and things add to one. So it's very easy to construct it. When you do that, however, you find that the... Uh, 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 Remember, we are in Fourier. To get back to the, the Wilson basis, we have to take the inverse Fourier transform. And so you can build that so that indeed these functions have uh, 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 exponential decay. But it turns out the decay is fairly slow if you construct them explicitly this way. So the, the, the Gaussian, cons I mean, so what we will do now, oh my god, it's time. Uh, uh, what, as we will conclude, a construction that you do via the dual frames turns out to be, uh, give much better decay and so be more convenient. Plus, as soon as you write things in terms of, 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 uh, of Gaussian decay, uh, if, if in a function of Gaussians, all your integrals become trivial integrals to compute because you have all these Gaussian expressions. So you don't have to do quadrature. You just have explicit expressions. Okay, so now we're going to conclude quickly because we are, we are although it seems that we're still very far, we're, we're, we're very close. I'm going to build a slightly different Zach transform because I can build that in many ways, and, uh, uh, but which satisfies very similar properties. Uh, I'm going to build uh, a Zach transform that uh, that builds in a, not a g, h, uh, h, uh, a translation here. I mean, what it's really is a scaled version of the old Zach transform. It doesn't matter. Uh, there's probably a square root 2 somewhere. Yes. Uh, yeah, there's a square root 2 here. And um, <coughs> what you find is that uh, the condition 
that you satisfy this if you define this Zach transform and you work it out is exactly the condition that this well let's let's um, Well, the computation is given in the paper and, and we are out of time. So what happens is that you find that this function which is a function uh, with a with uh, periodicity uh, a half in S and one in T. And uh, if you compute um, its Fourier transform, so if you compute its uh, uh, It's for your coefficients with respect to t. Uh, then it turns out that something that you get exactly this. Uh, let's say, no, phi. So this was a definition of that Zach <coughs> transform, sorry. And if I do this for a function phi, then I get exactly uh, phi uh, The result is that the condition <coughs> for a Wilson basis for a function phi, the construction that we, Jafar and Journé and, and I proposed to build the Wilson basis is exactly the same as for that function phi to generate a tight frame. And so what we have done, if you look at what you build in the tight frame, you combine things from different frequency regimes. And you also, you in fact, are combining two frames. You're combining the frame uh, with, with uh, 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 with a um, so so you look at a frame that's local it's twice as dense here and you also look at the other frame that is moved by a factor by by a, a, a half in frequency and so you so you now have a redundancy of four but then what you do is you combine positive and negative frequencies always which removes a factor two. And then in some cases you, you, you pick the cosine and in some cases you pick the sine. And that also removes a factor two. So you do a very funny reduction of that redundant frame, but one, uh, the conditions for the original frames to be tight is exactly the right condition for that funny reduction to give you an off-normal basis. So, I mean, you can rewrite another way, but in all cases, it amounts to saying, I had a very nice tight frame, and I am kind of, of wormholing things together in order to remove the redundancy and outfalls an orthonormal basis. I think there is probably some very nice algebraic structure hidden in this that hasn't been, been investigated in greater detail. Um, it's also uh, 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 kind of interesting that um, we, we <coughs> uh, 
mean, and I just want to, to close with that because it's an interesting remark that also I don't have a, a full uh, understanding of. I can explain and prove things to you, but I <laughs> in in for our frames in time frequency, we have seen that if you put the parameter t and omega on 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 uh, that we have this hyperbola that has no uh, uh, don't span you don't span the space and here you have uh, basic uh, frames very nice frames possible and then here you have orthonormal basis and what we have done is we have looked at the hyperbola here but we have recombined things in order to get to the right density in the case of wavelets, so I look at, I've looked at the, the, the dyadic wavelets, but in general you look at A, J, T minus uh, uh, K, B, and you normalize. And so you, you could say, let me look at the, the, uh, the B, A parameter space. And we know that, for instance, for A equals 2 and B equals 1, we have a very nice orthonormal basis. We also have other places where we have orthonormal basis. Um, but it seems there is not such a clear demarcation line. For one, even, I mean, uh, if, if you take the, um, if you take the Meyer wavelet itself, and you do dilate it a little bit, then the resulting collection of translates and dilates, but translates by a slightly bigger amount every time, still form a frame. You've lost the orthonormal basis because things are not felt, but you're still a frame. So you can have for the same A and, and a slightly bigger B, so here we have an orthonormal basis. But even though you could still have uh, 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 spanning is still possible. What happens is that even though at a fixed scale you have the impression, well, if I do 10,000 steps, I'll have holes, the things from other scales start helping you. So even though, I mean, it's, it's, it's mind-boggling to me because if we remember that lattice that I'd drawn, that hyperbolic lattice, it looks like I'm stretching the whole hyperbolic lattice everywhere. I mean, I take slightly different functions, but the lattice is stretched everywhere. And nevertheless, I still span. On the other hand, you can take a B that's slightly smaller and you can still have independent functions. So even though I'm compressing this whole lattice, taking slightly different functions, I still don't get something redundant. So it's a very different situation from here. We have this very sharp line. Um, although I can prove that you can do this, I don't really feel I understand why this is possible. So I'm going to leave you on that note. I mean, uh, so uh, food for thought. So sorry for having gone over time and sorry for not having quite finished this, but uh, okay.